So I'm Philip Eckberg, I'm a C Sharp MVP, and I work at Redify as a senior developer. Uh, you have my Twitter handle here, and you can ping me any questions that you might have, and I'll try to answer as many as possible. If you want an answer faster, if you buy my book and tell me, I'll, I'll try and help you as soon as possible, right? So the agenda for this talk is to talk a bit about what Xamarin is and, and a bit why we want to use that and why it's important. And then we'll take a look at how we can do this uh, by looking at a couple of demos. And if we have some time at the end, I know Louis is not here, so I have some bonus content that I might share with you if we have time. Depends on how many questions you might have. And if we have time at the end after that, we'll do a quick Q&A and you can ask any questions that you might like about Xamarin. So I've been doing mobile development to and from for the past four to five years, and it's shifted a lot uh, the, that past time. So I've been doing development for iOS, so I've been doing development for Android and Windows Phone, and it's really different coming from each the, of these platforms. I've had to look at Objective-C and Java and, and C Sharp for Windows Phone. So I want to talk about these strategies that we have when we want to target multiple devices. So about five years ago, a customer came to me and wanted to create an application that was available in the App Store, but they also wanted to be able to edit the content whenever they wanted. So for this, we wanted to do a hybrid application where we write the content using HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, and then create a native wrapper and just push that up to the store. Now, just that took a really long time for just doing like a simple wrapper, introducing like a web thing that just opens up a website. So they wanted to have the best of both worlds, right? They want to have their web content represented as an app, and then they want the, the native experience as well for a part of the application. So this brings us into the first approach with cross-platform development. It's the right ones for every platform. This requires that we have one team that are experts on all of these different platforms. So we need one team that are experts on Objective-C, we need one team that are experts on Java, and one team that are experts on C Sharp. The problem with this is that we have too many people, too many teams needing to understand the same acceptance criteria. It's hard enough having one team understanding what the client wants. Imagine three teams needing to understand the same things. And all these different platforms work differently, so it's really hard to share the code among these different platforms. So this brings us to a bit further into the future, where we talk about write once and run everywhere. We have some black box that converts our C Sharp, uh, our HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, and ActionScript, and Lua, and, and whatnot, to these native platforms. The problem with this approach is that the client will only get like, um, a common denominator of, of all the features. So you'll have to settle back to, these things are only available on all the platforms. I can't really do any platform-specific things. So the problem we had back in the day when I started writing this first application was that the client wanted something in HTML and JavaScript. The, the mobile space wasn't really developed back then, and we noticed that it wasn't really performing well enough. So they expected to get a native performance from something written in HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, which, which isn't really the case. Of course, we cut down the development cost comparing to creating one application for each platform by like two times but they didn't get what they expected. So the benefit of going with native applications is that we get native performance, which means that the application runs on the native device, it's native code, everything runs, runs nicely. But the downside is that it's gonna cost a lot more. So Xamarin solves this, yep. Uh, uh, can I get you to expand on uh, the customers didn't get what they expected a little more? <laughs> All right, so so your question was, um, can I go into more detail what the customer expected from the native experience or the application that we developed and that they didn't get? Is that a question? Yes, you said that um, the customers didn't get what they expected. Ah, right. <laughs> well, <laughs> all right, so that's a bit vague. That's pretty common, right, when you do application development. But in this case, they expected us to create an application. They, they were fairly uh, common to the iOS platform back then, so we first targeted iOS, the iOS platform. So when we give them an application written in HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, it's not really performing as all the other applications in the App Store. They're getting an experience that isn't really known to that platform. It feels slow and it feels sluggish and it's not really performing as well as they would expect. 
So they expected us to give them something that was really performant, felt like an iOS application, and we were giving them something that feels like a website inside on a wrapper inside a phone. Maybe it's, we should have asked other questions when we started writing the application, but th that's one of the things that I've seen when we've done applications for more clients in the, in the past, that it ends up, if we go with this HTML, CSS, and JavaScript approach, it ends up being a disappointment for, for someone. Someone's going to complain about the performance. There's things you can do about that. You can use Sencha, for instance, which is a really nice JavaScript uh, framework to use for mobile development, and that makes it really performant and nice. Um, however, that would possibly take longer than going with the approach that I introduced now. Did that answer the question? Cool. Um, so Xamarin solves this in a quite uniquely approach. They're introducing um, a new way of creating mobile, mobile applications. And they're doing this by allowing us to write applications for all the major platforms. So this includes iOS, Android, and Windows Phone. And something to keep in mind is that Windows Phone is actually 10% of the market worldwide. And in, the, in about 24 developing countries, it's selling more than iOS. So when people say that we don't want to support Windows Phone, but we need to support Android 2.1, then that's really not a good, um, good approach. You want to reach all your, your target audience, which is most likely some of the Windows Phone users. And the reason that I don't mention other platforms like, like BlackBerry, it's because it's deprecated. <laughs> don't want to do the apps for that anymore. Um, so Xamarin gives you two things that are really important. It gives us a native user experience, a native user interface. And when I talk about the native user interface, that's the interface that the users will expect to have in the application. So a button in iOS looks like a button that you would create in Objective-C in Xcode. And in Android, that's the equivalent, right? It also gives us the native performance. And by that, I mean the code is going to run on the device. It's not going to run in some website that is inside a managed environment, inside a managed web view. It's going to run directly on the device. It's going to be really performant and really nice. And it's really going to give us an awesome development experience. And the reason for that is that we can use one language to reach all these major devices. So we're going to use one language. We're going to use C Sharp. And we're going to target all these different platforms. Now you might think that we're doing the right ones and run everywhere approach, but this is a bit different. One of the first things that people tend to ask me is, so how does Xamarin compare to native applications? And it's the same thing. Xamarin runs natively. What happens is that the code that you write in C Sharp is going to be compiled down to what the native executables are. So for iOS devices, that's going to be the IPA file. And for Android, which have um, a mono runtime, it's going to be compiled down to IL. And then we have the APK file. That's going to be JIT compiled on the Android device. And it's going to be really performant. So why would you bother doing any C Sharp? And why would you bother doing Xamarin? It's really one simple quest, uh, answer to that, and it's because all these devices combined together reach 2.5 plus billion devices. And even if not all of these people would buy our applications, it's really a, a huge crowd of, crowd of people that we can reach with an application. So instead of doing uh, an application for each of these platforms, we have iOS, which is both the iPad and the iPhone. We have Android, that is the huge amount of different tablets and phones out there. All the Windows platforms, the Windows phones, the Windows tablets, the Macs, and all that. We can reach that with one language. And it gets even easier with the latest release of Xamarin, which I'll show you in just a moment. So with the latest release of Xamarin, we've got something called Xamarin Forms. Previously, we've had one development experience, which equals to the one on the, on the left here. You share just the business logic in your application. And the... This results in us sharing about 90% of our code. There's some use, um, uh, that's where I'm looking for, um, there's some case studies, sorry. There's some case studies out there showing that you can share about 90% of the code inside your application when doing Xamarin. However, with the release of Xamarin, we can now also share the UI code. So that means that we can write one code base with C Sharp and share most of the code, which means that we don't have to be redundant. 
I'll show you an example of this later. I've written the same application doing both of these different approaches. And in one of the approaches, I had to focus on making the UI for each different platform. So you still want to give the, the users the native experience and the native user interface. That's the whole point of Xamarin, and the whole point of using C Sharp is to share most of the business logic. And then I compared that to doing something in Xamarin Forms where I only care about this is what I want to have inside my application. I have the data over here. I know that it's going to be a list on all the devices. So I don't care about what a list implementation looks like on iOS. I just want a list over there. Someone else take care of that. So they abstracted that from, from the API so I don't have to care about how to create a list on iOS and how to create a list on Android. They just take care of that. However, I can divert from that and create my own UI if I want to do that. I can still do the old approach that I've done in the first application if I want to do something else than Xamarin Forms. So when introducing Xamarin Forms, we get a couple of new concepts to our development for mobile uh, devices. We have different pages inside the applications with, which makes up for, for detailed pages, navigations and tabs and, and carousels. These are different concepts that work differently on the different platforms. For instance, have you ever seen a tabbed, um, tabbed view on Windows Phone? I doubt that. So mostly you have this, this panorama view where you scroll from the sides. And if you use this in Xamarin Forms, I'd expect you get some, something similar to that. And on iOS, you get the buttons on the bottom. And on Android, it probably works differently. And with this, we also get different layouts. So have anyone in here done any iOS development? Hands up. Like two, three people. All right. So the problem with iOS is that everything is, is absolute layout. So you can say, at, uh, at the top, I have one element, and then just add something after that. It gets really hard, because you need to absolute position everything. So with these layouts that we get with Xamarin Forms, we get a couple of different approaches that we can use. So we have something called a stack. We have absolute positioning. We have a relative positioning. We have a grid view. We have content view. We have scroll views and frames. So all these different things help us solve these different problems. So I can say on iOS now that, I want to stack view, just stack controls after each other. Just make it work. I don't have to care about the implementation anymore. And of course, this helps us reach a lot of different controls. So you might think that, oh, I want to add a button. I want to have a web view. I want to have I don't know, date picker, editor, map, list view, slider. So these are all the controls that are shipping with, with Xamarin Forms. And they're adding new controls all the time. And you can even add your own controls. So if you want to share the entire UI, um, you can go with the Xamarin Forms approach. And I found that in data-driven applications where I just need to add data, retrieve data, display data in some way, I can just do that with Xamarin Forms. I don't have to care about the specific implementations on the different devices. So people ask me, can I really do everything in C Sharp and with Xamarin? And this is one of the, the most interesting questions, because people ask me, oh, I have this third-party library on GitHub that is in Objective-C. I've compiled that, and I have the, the whatever the compiled versions are on my laptop. I need to use that. And they continue asking these types of questions, and they continue asking, can I really do that? Can I do that? Can I do that? And I just answer it, yes to everything. You can do whatever you want. The thing is that you can do, like, p-invokes with, uh, with Xamarin and C Sharp but in the specific way to, to iOS and Android. So you have something called binding projects that you can say, I have this native thing in iOS. I want to use that. It's third party. I'll just create some binding for that and make it work. But I've never had to do that because everything is just present in the API that I want to do. So they have 100% API coverage for all of these different platforms. So we have these three different things that show up here. It's corresponding to the different platforms. So with Xamarin, we get three different projects. You have one solution, you have the iOS project, you have the Android project, and the Windows Phone project. And in these different UI projects, you can access the native APIs. So you have the NFC API for, for Android, for instance, because there's no NFC on iPhone yet. And you have different things on the iOS API that you don't have present in the Android API. However, you want to share most of the code. You want to give the users the same experience. So that means you don't really have to do too much of these native interactions. However, things like the file system works differently on all the different platforms. So we'd probably have to do that on the, on the platform-specific level. I'll get into that more when we talk about shared code. So there's a 100% API coverage. That means that anything you find on GitHub or anything you find on 
on Stack Overflow, you can just use that. And I re the reason that I say that is because there's familiar APIs. So I found that when I've developed Android applications with Xamarin, I've had some problems with memory leaks, which isn't really odd on Android. But I just Google up quickly on the problem I have. I find some Java code. I bring that into Xamarin Studio. And of course, it doesn't compile because it's Java code. But I just uppercase everything and just works. Because they've thought about that, they've made the APIs look exactly like you expect. They've just c sharpified everything. It's a bit harder for iOS because there's more things to remove from the, from the things you find because there's a lot of weird stuff going on there. And this is really cool, so it's always up to date. They've had an awesome track record for shipping the same day support for all of these different platforms. So if you look at the previous releases of iOS 5, 6, 7, 7.1, and 8, they've had all same day shipping support for them. I'm mentioning 8 because I just released the SDK for that, and iOS 8 is still in beta, so I expect them to have full support the same day that's released to, uh, to everyone in here. I'm not really mentioning Android here because Android users don't tend to update their phones. They just update their phones when they buy a new one. And the reason for that is because the phone manufacturers don't really want you to update your phone. They want you to buy a new one. Interesting enough, they did release the same day support for the new Amazon Fire Phone, if you've seen that being talked about in, on Twitter and all the social media. So Amazon released this new phone. It's uh, based on Android, but they have some interesting native features like you can tilt the phone weirdly and it scrolls and you can do a lot of cool stuff with that. So they released an API for that so you can use that in Xamarin now as well. So you might ask, why do you want to do C Sharp? The first one that pops up here is async and await. So we want to use async and await when we do UI heavy application development. And what more UI heavy is an application where you should put, push the things on the screen all the time? It's not like a web device where it's stateless and all that. Here we really want to give the user as good an experience as possible. And a good way to do that is using async and await. If done properly and not deadlocking all the time, you really do give the user a good experience. And if you've done any Objective-C or Java, doing asynchronous programming there, it's really hard. So doing that in C Sharp is really awesome. And of course, we can do link to anything. Most of our applications are probably data-driven, and doing link to objects or link to XML or link to whatever you want to do, that's possible as well. And we have the full power of the .NET framework, which is really awesome. And if we're doing portable class libraries, the, uh, the BCL and the async stuff, they're all PCLified, so you can just pull that into your PCL projects and everything is still present. So C Sharp, all the things. Now that we've decided that we want to do Xamarin and we know how to do that, we're convinced that this is the right way to do it because it's going to cut down costs, it's going to be easier to maintain. We want to distribute this application. So when we normally distribute our applications, we might do that from within Xcode or however you do that natively for Android. But the thing is that this compiles down to the native executables. So I can just log into iTunes Connect. They support you to upload a binary directly. You don't have to do that via Xcode. So you can log in and upload your binary compile with Xamarin. And the same is, is for, for Android. You can log into Google Play. You can upload your binary for your application. And you do the same for Windows Store and Windows Phone applications. It's really awesome. So you can distribute your application just as you've done in the past. And a project that I've been working on, we even set up beta users and beta testers using TestFlight. So we automatically publish our applications to that and let our users be notified when there's a new update to the application. There's some manual work behind that, but you can just point them to the URL to test flight and have them update that automatically. Everything works as you expect on the iPhone device and Android. So the next thing is pricing. Now most of you probably aren't affected by the pricing, someone else pays for that. But if you do care about the pricing, there's a couple of different levels. And if you want to get started with Xamarin, you can download the free version. The free version doesn't let you create an unlimited app size. That means that when you pull in things from NuGet and your application starts to grow, you need to upgrade to the indie level. And that means that you have to pay one license per user and per platform. So if you want to target both Android and iOS, you have to pay two licenses. But if you compare the costs, I know that $2,000 per year is probably sounding a lot of money, but comparing to running three teams instead of one, it, it's really cutting the costs. And comparing business to enterprise level, I think that it's only an enterprise where you can do uh, WCF interactions. So that's something to have in mind. 
and the business level is the only one that gives you interaction in, in Visual Studio. So as developers, we don't really like to repeat ourselves and we want to have other people do the work for us. So there's something called the Xamarin Component Store. It's like NuGet for Xamarin Components. So imagine that you want to create some, some awesome UI thing inside your application. You can bet that someone else has already done that and published that. So they have this Xamarin Component Store, which is available online. You can just go there and, and pull in things to your project. So for instance, you have Azure Mobile Services, which is just an integration with the Azure Mobile Services, and it's available for all the different platforms. So you have information in the Xamarin Component Store on which platforms are supported and how much the component cost. Now the one for Azure Mobile Services doesn't cost anything, but comparing to the signature pad, which you can see here, that one is like $200. So I thought about doing an application where you can log your dives. I started diving and I wanted to, to log all my dives. I wanted to take pictures of the dive site, check in where the GPS coordinates are. But divers are like back in the past, they want to do everything in a logbook that is paper. Uh, so I wanted to create an application, but I still want this, this verification process where someone signs my, my logging. So I found this signature pad thing, cost 200 bucks, never got around to create the application, but if I did, it would probably cost me more time than 200 bucks to, to create this signature thing, right? And make it authentic. And there's integration into Visual Studio and there's a bunch of components that we can bring in. All right, so how do we go by creating this here? The first approach is that we can use something that is called Xamarin Studio. That's what we get when we install Xamarin. And this is available for both PC and Mac. And then we can, of course, use Visual Studio. I probably don't have to convince you why you want to use Visual Studio, but you get really great tooling in Visual Studio. You have all the support from ReSharper and CodeLens and all, all of those awesome things that help us be productive. So you have an integration in Visual Studio. However, you can't really compile iOS applications in Visual Studio or on Windows natively. The problem is that Apple has a really interesting license that tells us you can't compile anything for our platforms on other things than a Mac. So that's why I have a Mac here, so I can compile my iOS applications. That doesn't mean that I can't do it in Visual Studio, it just means that I have a Mac, need to have a Mac presence. And in Xamarin Studio, we can't do Windows Forms development, uh, sorry, Windows uh, phone development, because why would they port that when they want everyone to use C Sharp and build everything on Windows instead of going on the Mac. So you can use Visual Studio for doing the, the Windows Phone development because the experience for Windows Phone development is really top notch. So I'd like to show you uh, the Visual Studio integration. We can develop for all these different platforms. So we have iOS, we have Android and Windows Phone. Everything in one solution. So I'm running on my Mac here and I have every, everything set up so I can just swap between Windows and, and Mac using Parallels. So here I have a solution. I've created an application. This is using Xamarin Forms. I've created an application in here. I've simply gone up to do File, New, Project. And then we can use Mobile Apps down here. And then I can select to, to create a blank application that is um, depending on Xamarin Forms. There are two different ways that we can do that. We can either say that I want to use the new thing called Shared Libraries. So with the uh, introduction of universal applications for Windows and Windows phones, they introduce a new concept called shared projects. Basically, it means that when you compile your project, it pulls everything in from the shared project and compiles that as a part of your project. So we can use that approach, which means that all the files that we have in, in that project is just going to be linked in, in, in compile time. Or we can use the portable class library approach that we've probably seen before. But I've created one here that uses the shared project and the way that we see that is this very nice icon up here. This one here shows that it's a shared project. So it doesn't have really any references or anything like that. It just has a couple of files. And these files are linked into the other projects that references that on compile time. So let me show you when this application is running. I'm over at the iOS simulator. And I have this application running here. So basically, this is going to load a couple of entries from Hacker News. I've stored this locally so it doesn't crash. Um, but I can click something here, it navigates to a web view and shows whatever is, is present on that site. I can navigate back 
and this all looks very iPhone-y. Although it doesn't look beautiful because I'm not a UX guy, so I don't really care about the paddings and all that. I've just added a list view, it's a, it's a nice list, I don't care about anything else. It's just It looks like an iOS application, I'd say. So if we can take a look at the Android version, we can see that this looks a bit different. It looks similar, so we can recognize the application, but it looks like it's an Android application. If I click this here now, it's a different way of approaching itself to me. I click the thing and it pops up instead of popping in. We have this back thing up here. We can still click the back button down here. So it works like an Android application would do. And of course, we have the, uh, the Windows Phone version as well. I forgot to plug my phone in, but I'll do that now. And I'll show you something else that is pretty cool. So if you're doing Windows Phone development and you want to show off your devices during screen sharing or something like that, there's an application called Project My Screen. It looks like this. So I can say that I allow screen projection. So I can just um, swap around inside my application in here. And I can go ahead and say in Visual Studio that I want this to uh, set the Windows project as the startup project. And start this on my device. And hopefully this is going to work. I think it's going to crash because this points to a local instance. You'll just have to trust me that it works. So basically, it looks like a Windows Phone application when you get to the Windows Phone. It's the same list thing as you saw here. We, we're using the same UI concept. It's the same height of these two things. Even though the Android device is larger, I've still applied the sign paddings and the same, same height. But it still look a bit like the native application running on that. So take, let's take a look at what the code looks like. So I'm using Xamarin Forms here. Let me just pin that. So you'll notice there's two things in here that are quite interesting. We have an app file and we have a, a SAML file. So Xamarin Forms lets us create applications for all these different devices using SAML. And the SAML is going to look fairly similar to what you probably have seen before if you've done any, any Windows Phone development. So remember before I said that we have things like the content page, uh, which we can see up here. We have stack layouts, we have list views. Um, and then if you've done any Windows Phone application development, you know that we can do data binding. So I can say that I have this template here, and it's going to display some data in this way. But I'm not saying where the data is coming from. I'm not expecting to be interacting with that from here. So I'm doing an MVVM approach here, uh, which is pretty nice to have accessible on all these different platforms. So I'm just saying that I'm going to bind to something. My source of items is going to be something. And when this is tapped, I'm going to do something. So when I tap that, I have a um, code behind method here called untapped. So I'm simply just binding to the code behind, which is not ideal. You should probably use commands for this or do something on your, your view model instead. Um, let's dig into the code a bit more later. So this here is what is executed on all the different platforms. It's really interesting to see that this is the only code that I wrote to get that UI. The interaction with the API, which we're going to look at later, isn't really important in this case. But what's interesting is that I actually didn't touch the, the Android project, iOS project, or Windows Phone project. I just said, start this project. I have my SAML file. I'm just going to edit that. And it just works on all the devices. So what's in these things here, it's just standard stuff that it added for me. So it's simply saying that I'm going to set up Xamarin Forms. I'm going to set the startup page from the app.get main page. So this is what retrieves that Hacker News page. That's all that happens. And that's all there is to all these different platforms. So Xamarin Forms lets me create that nice user interface in one shared place and then just interact with that. So let's take a look at what this looks like in, in Xamarin Studio. You'll get a chance to look more deeply into that later on. And I'm going to go down into showing some more code at the end here. So here we have the same project. But uh, sorry, what's this other one? Uh, so here we have the, have the same project inside Xamarin Studio. So this is the Xamarin Studio that you get installed when, when you install Xamarin on your, on your Mac. So when I'm on Windows, I get both Visual Studio and I get Xamarin Studio. The problem is that I can't do Windows applications inside my Mac. 
But the development experience inside, inside Xamarin Studio is really good for iOS and Android. And, and I'd really recommend using this one here when we are doing applications for on the Mac. If we're just targeting iOS and Android, there's no point in being in Visual Studio if you don't have a lot of time invested and a lot of money invested in the, in the extensions for Visual Studio. Because as you see here, it's complaining about you can't compile this on this platform. As of this release of Xamarin Studio, it doesn't pop up anymore, but the previous releases gave us a pop-up every time that we tried to open a Windows Phone project, which, which led me to have two different solutions for the same thing, which isn't really an ideal case. So here I have the same thing. I have my shared project. I have the SAML file here. I have my Android project, and I can run this here from within uh, Xamarin Studio, just as I ran this from Visual Studio. And that's going to start off on my Android emulator. Like I mentioned, that I'm not using the native Android emulator because that's horribly slow. So I'm using something called Motion. There's a free version for that available. And it's based on uh, VirtualBox, so it's real virtualization. So that fires that up. And of course, I get the application installed here somewhere. And you can set breakpoints in, in both of these environments. So I'd like to show you that as well. I tricked you, I never showed you that I actually started the project for, for iOS in here. So I said before that you can't really do iOS development on Windows or you can't compile that on Windows. So how come that I can debug this application from Visual Studio? The thing is that if we go ahead and look in the tools menu and have a look at Xamarin, we have some iOS settings that says find a Mac. And it's found my Mac because I'm running in the same environment. So I'm hooked up to something called the Xamarin build host. I have a program running in, in my Mac, in my Mac instance. So over here, I have some program running in the background. And over here, I'm saying connect to that program, shove all the code over there when I need to compile that, and give me back the result. So that's why I can say start this in debug. And it hooks up to the, so it said I'm, I'm not, what's in here? Come on. It's connecting. Connected. There we go. Or not. I'll repair them. That probably works. So this is how you pair your, app, your uh, Visual Studio instance with, uh, with Visual Studio. Let's do find Mac. For those of you that don't use a Mac, what's the best way to find a Mac? <laughs> the Apple Store. <laughs> Someone say that already? <laughs> um, is there a service? Yeah, there's something called uh, Mac in Cloud. Yeah, so your question was, is there a service that I can use instead of buying a Mac? You can use something called Mac in Cloud. Um, it's a cloud service where you can rent a Mac per hour, and it lets you do Xamarin interactions with that. I haven't used that in a long time, but previously it was pretty slow. But I'm hoping that it's better now. <laughs> so you can give that a shot. All right, so now it's telling me that everything is, is all good. It's all hooked up, so I can set a breakpoint in here. I can hopefully say that this, uh, hopefully that should work. Um, let's head over to the Mac and see if this fires off a new iPad simulator. So I selected an older version of iPad, the, uh, running the iOS version 6.1 instead of 7. So we'll see here if that, if that works. It should look a bit different from what we saw before. The list should probably have a more, more uh, gradient to it um, than compared to the flat white on the new iOS 7. Or not. Oh, that's a good point. Didn't start at all. Probably crashed. Let's choose that instead. iPhone Retina. That always works. See, they don't want you to buy old phones either. Mm -hmm. hmm. And the breakpoint is actually inside the Android activity, so that's probably why I didn't reach that when starting the iPhone device. So let me. If you plug in your device, can you 
uh, reach that and compile and publish and debug to that? Um, easily, no. <laughs> Depends on what platform you're, you're developing on. If you're doing iOS, it's a bit cumbersome to get that to work. You need to register the, the device. You need to add that to a provisioning profile. You need to install some certificate on your device and install that on your laptop as well. And you need to hook that up into Xamarin Studio. Or it's the same process as you do for Xcode. So it's really not the ideal approach. But for Android and Windows Phone, you just plug the device and it works like it should. Um. Oh, there we go. It worked. Um. So I didn't reach any breakpoints that time. But if I go ahead and go into my share project, let's see if I can set a breakpoint in here for when I tap something. So I click that here and reach my breakpoint. So I'm crossing my different platforms, right? I have my iOS simulator running on my Mac. I have Windows connected to that. And I'm interacting with the, with the environments. So we're really getting that awesome experience here. I can do everything that I can do in, in Visual Studio and have everything that I'm used to in here. So before I dig down too much into this code here, I want to show you what happens when we create a new project. So I can create a new solution. And as I said before, if I do this on the, on the Mac, which I'm doing here, I'm in Xamarin Studio. I want to show you the development experience in here. Most of you are probably familiar with Visual Studio, so let's take a different approach on this. So I can create iOS applications. I can create mobile apps. I can do Android applications. But I can't do the Windows phones in here. So if I want to do that platform, I need to be on Windows. But in here, I can say that I want to create a new iOS application. I want to create a new. Um, single view application for iOS. Let's call this iOS demo. Let's do that. And we'll see that we are getting a couple of things here to start off with. So there's two different, or actually three different concepts now that we can use for UI. Previously, we'd had to do the, the standard nib files and the interaction with that for iOS. But, but then we have something called storyboarding, which means that we can lay out our entire application in one file, sort of, and show what this looks like. Um, so we're saying that here's one of the views in my application. When I click a button, you're heading over to this view, and that view looks like that. So we're simply just getting a workspace like this where we can add new views, we can create new buttons, and we can drag and drop things that, that you'd expect. So I can say that, let's see if I can do button here. Let's not do that. Let's just start this and show you off what a basic application looks like. But you get the idea. You have a nice visual interface here. You can drag things onto that. You can, can create all your UI like that. But there's really no reason creating your UI like that anymore when you have Xamarin Forms. If you don't have too much time invested in, in storyboarding and other applications using that, there's really no point in not doing Xamarin Forms. So as I said before, I had two different applications written for the same, same thing. Uh, so as you see here, uh, this is blank. So as I said before, I had two different approaches, right? I have never used storyboarding to create my applications. I've either used the, the nib files for iOS and the Android XML for Android, or I've gone with the Xamarin Forms approach. And I said that, all right, look, it's easier to do, the, do it with Xamarin Forms, and it's, it's a bit more code doing it the old-fashioned way. And doing the interface, doing the storyboarding is supposed to be much easier, but now that we can abstract all this, there's really no point in, in going that route. But what I want to show here is that there's a great uh, experience when doing UI, and it's even a great experience doing UI for Android. So we can do the same thing here. We have an Android, let's do an empty Android application. So in this solution, we have simply a main activity. Uh, that's the Android specific for how I start my application. It's like the app.cs in Windows Phone. Um, and then we have some resources. So Android has a different way than iOS or of using, doing interfaces. So on iOS, you have storyboarding or the nib files, or you're using Xamarin Forms. On Android, you do either Android XML or you do Xamarin Forms. So the Android XML is simply, um, uh, simply a similar experience to uh, SAML. So we can take a look at the code here. They didn't want to go with something pre predefined, so they're, of course, creating their own stuff. 
Um, so for, SAM, uh, for Android XML, we can add buttons in here, we can add web views, and we can add lists and all that you might expect, right? And we do get a visual, um, visual interface here that we can drag and drop stuff to. Um, I just swapped between different versions of Xamarin Studio, so that seems to break sometimes. Uh, which is why I like to work in, in Visual Studio instead, because the integration with Xamarin inside Visual Studio rarely breaks, but the one on Mac seems to be a bit more unstable for some reason. It might just be me not too comfortable with using the, the Mac version. So I wanted to show you two more things here before we continue. And that's the difference between the two applications that I created. So here inside here, I have my three UI layers. I have my, let's zoom in here. I have my, my Windows Phone project. I have my iOS project and the Android project. And I didn't do anything to these projects. All I did was to add some logic to load all the data somewhere else. Where I did that isn't really important right now. And then I have the, the shared project with all the shared UI. I'm, I'm saying that I have this UI. It's going to be applicable to all these devices. It's really straightforward. So if I take a look at the, the approach that I did the other time, so I have the same approach here. It's called something different. But it's the same thing. I have my Windows Phone version. I have my iOS project. I have my Droid project. And I have this shared project, with, which I had in the other one as well. But in this shared project, I'm just handling all the data. It's my repository to interact with my, my API. So if you, you had a quick look at the other one, you notice that there's actually four projects in here. It's the shared one, and it's these ones here. So where do I do the UI in here? Well, it tends to be a lot more files in each project. For Windows Phone, I have my views. I have my view models. I'm hooking all that up using MVVM. I'm using, um, using principles to do that. I'm using tooling to do MVVM on Windows Phone, to do property injections and doing constructor injection and all that. I'm injecting my views and view models and all that. You might be experienced too if you've done Windows Phone development. And then when we look at the iOS version, I have an MVC pattern. I'm doing controllers. I have views in here as well, but I'm doing the views in code. And I have my models in here as well. And then when we go, out to go over to Android, we have an MVC pattern again. But it looks different. We have something called activities. We have, we have our layout files. And it all just differentiates between these different platforms. So here I had to put so much effort into making the UI for different platforms. I had to invest more time into doing that. And when I showed this the first time, I got a comment from someone saying, like, you're not sharing any code at all among your different platforms. So what's the point? I just did one interaction with one API. I fetched a JSON file, right? So that's not too much code to share. So most of it was UI. But now looking at the new approach with Xamarin Forms, I have a lot more code shared among these different, different platforms. All right. So let's head over to the PowerPoint again. So the down fall with doing Xamarin Studio, I'd say, is that you don't get this Windows Phone experience. And there's really no reason not to target Windows Phone users, since they actually do stand for 10% of the market. So we didn't look at the code that I actually did reuse. We looked at the UI level, the Windows, uh, the, the Xamarin Forms. I always confuse Xamarin Forms with Windows Forms. They should have used another name. <laughs> but I didn't show you the code that I reused in the shared portable class library. So the way that you reuse the business logic is by introducing portable class libraries. It's interesting with the portable class libraries that when you get this box here to tick in which platforms you want to target, it swaps between different project types. So there's one project for each different combination. Imagine the job setting that up. <laughs> Must have been really fun. So there's actually combinations that aren't even valid. So if I tick out Samurai Niles here, it knows that I want Samurai and Android, so it's just going to give us Xamarin IOS anyways. So we have different approaches when it comes to code sharing. It's probably one of the most common code sharing patterns out there is to inject implementations. So consider that I have a shared library where I, I expect to be able to do something. Let's say that the, the storage works differently on all the different platforms. It works differently on iOS, Android, and Windows Phone. So I want to access the, um, the local storage on all these devices. But I don't want to have redundant code, so I don't want to move all my caching storage things into the, the, the device-specific projects. 
So what I do then is that I say, all right, I have this interface here. I just expect each device to give me an implementation of that. And then you can just expect to be able to save and load files. The other approach is to inject action and functions. I'd say that that's a little looser than doing uh, contracts. So I'm referring to in interfaces as contracts and implementing actions and functions sort of lets people do whatever they want. Sure, you can have a, a signature of an action and function, but it doesn't really, it doesn't feel like it's enforcing you to do something as an interface would do. So here's a concrete example of how you can do that. Create an interface called iFoo in your portable class library. So this is where I interacted with the API. And let's say that I want to store this here on my disk. So then I have the implementation iOS.foo and Droid.foo in the respective platform that handles all that. It sounds straightforward, but it's a really nice way to do it. And previously, Samarin also advised you that you can do code sharing and, and things like that by using uh, compiler directives. So you can do file linking. You can say that I have this file here. It solves all my problems. And I have compiler directives that says, if this is Android, do this code. If this is iOS, do this code. But that tends to get pretty hard to debug and pretty hard to, to work with. So I'd, ex I'd expect to see more things like this. The reason that I even talk about injecting actions and functions is um, Azure Mobile Services doesn't allow you to have a common interface. So in the, in the case of where you can't have a common interface in your portable class library, you can say that I just expect to be able to call a login method here, just pass that action in here, and I'll, I'll call that when it's appropriate. So let's take a look at that code. So I'll be showing that inside Visual Studio instead of Xamarin Studio. So I have this portable class library here. It's inside my Xamarin Forms application. And what I have in here is simply something that, that I call Hacker News Repository. And I have a couple of models. Now the models are just simple DTOs. They're just ID posted by and a lot of information about each post. Same goes for, for the page here. However, this, the, uh, the Hacker News Repository simply interacts with an API that I have online or in this case, on, on my machine here. It opens up a JSON file. It deserializes that and gives me back some type of data. Now, my device for iOS, Android, and Windows Phone don't really care about where the API is, how to deserialize that. And as you see down here, I'm saying, deserialize this to a page and then give me the result, which is in reality the, the entries and that model. So that's what the user experience and the user interface level expect to get. And it's all async. So this is a very small thing that I have inside my portable class library, but expect that if I add caching here, I need to store this in the local storage. I need to be able to add things in the API. I need to be, call, be able to call put, delete, and all that. It gets pretty nice to have all this shared inside the application. So I showed you, showed you the, uh, the binding and the UI and how I shared that among the devices. And one thing that you might not have seen is that there's actually no visual, visual uh, guidance for that. You can't do drag and dropping yet, but I'd expect that Xamarin comes out with something for that for the SAML files. That would be awesome. So how do I set up the data binding? Well, I want to interact with my API somehow, and I want to say that I have this Hacker News page that I'm creating. That's my SAML file. And then, what, then I'm saying that when this SAML file is appearing, which is this here, I'm simply giving this on an asynchronous event handler. I'm saying here's an asynchronous um, method, which is going to interact with so some other method that we want to wait. So the reason that I mark this event handler as async is because I'm doing a wait down here. So I'm saying I have this shared repository, create a new, new instance of that, and just fetch something. And when that is done, add that to the page, page's binding context. And that's what I'm binding to in the SAML file. So I have the full power of the MVVM pattern here. Now, of course, all the code in here isn't best practice. You always want to be unsubscribing from your events. Otherwise, you'll end up having a bit of problems. Um, but this is just to show you how, how you can do that and how you set the binding for that, that SAML view. And then I can also say that, all right, so we have a navigation view. So, so you notice that when I click something or tap something, it navigates to another page. I do that by calling this navigation, navigation page here. So I just store that as a static property on my app file. 
So when I actually do tap something, I can interact with that and say, hey, go to this web view instead. Which I have in here. So we have this on tap method. I'm simply saying that I'm going to get the, the argument that I clicked on. That's going to be the item that I clicked on inside my SAML file. And then I'm saying, all right, so create a new web view for me in code. So now you see the power of SAML informs here again. So there's two ways of interacting with SAML informs. Either we use the, the SAML files, or we can do this in code like this. So I'm simply saying that I have this web view here. Create that for me. Set the source to whatever I clicked on. So I'm storing the URL to, to the news item that I clicked. And then I'm simply saying, all right, so push something asynchronously onto the view stack. And that's going to do a navigation to that, to that item. And having a look here at the SAML file again, we see that I'm just finding that on tapped event up here. I'd like to have that as a command, but I haven't done that in this case. And then we can simply do the, the binding that we'd expect. So I had a look at how I had a look at how SAML works for Windows Phone, and it's really, really similar. It was a couple of years or a couple of months since I did SAML, uh, did SAML for Windows Phone or Silverlight, but it's so similar that I could see how, how it worked previously and just expect how it would work on, on SAML forms. It's really awesome. All right, so I mentioned that you can do this in both SAML and C Sharp. So I've actually done the same thing doing C Sharp. So instead of doing SAML, you could create all of these things using C Sharp. It all compiles down to something like this, and then in its turn, it's compiling down to the native user in interface. So I'm doing the same thing here. I'm setting up a list view, setting up a stack view, and, and putting that onto the UI. I'm saying that when you appear, there's an asynchronous over overridden method here. I'm calling my API. I'm calling my API, setting that data template or item template, and just setting the source to that. It's pretty neat. All right. So that's about it for, for the Samarine stuff. I have some bonus material. We have a bit of time left. Um, I want to talk about Azure mobile services. So when we're talking about mobile devices, we want to be able to store data. We want to be able to interact with data. We want to be able to do a lot of things with the web, right? We want to interact with different services. We want to have all our data on other places than our own device. So Sam, uh, Azure Mobile Services lets us do this. It gives us authentication. It gives us custom APIs. It gives us notifications. It gives us data and scheduling and scaling and all that. It's a lot of stuff. Like, like it's, it's solving all the world problems in one platform. So I see this as my cloud-based backend. So I have this application, and, and I'm using this in some other application where I have a lot of data in the client application. So let's say that you used to want to subscribe to something. Then I can just say, like, OK, I'll shove that up to the Azure Mobile Service. And then when there's a new entry added to, to my news repository somewhere, I'll just ping the user with a notification service. And that's all available in Azure Mobile Services. There's a free edition, which gives us 20 megs of data. Um, that's actually 20 megs of data. It's not 20 megs with the overhead of SQL Server. So there's actually 20 megs of storage. And the reason that I say a cloud-based backend is because we actually do create the backends ourselves. We do get a boilerplate out of the box that we can use, and it's, it's good enough. However, we can customize the create, update, delete, and read things with a JavaScript or a .NET. So I can modify this backend, which is written in either JavaScript or .NET, and perform different things. Imagine that when I'm inserting something into my mobile service, I want to send an SMS to someone. Then I can do that from the back end. I can interact with some other web API that allows me to send SMS. I don't have to do that from the phone. I don't have to do that from some other service. I can just let my back end solve that. And it's powered by a SQL database. I think it's SQL Azure that it's running in the back end. And we do get a REST API out of the box. So you have this um, library that you can use to interact with the Azure mobile services. And you also get a REST API that you can use. So for authentication, they're using OAuth. So you can connect with a Microsoft account. You can connect with Twitter, Facebook, and an Azure AD. So I set up an application where I'm, I'm doing all of these different authentications. The problem is that with Twitter, uh, you need to have a live application and a live website to be able to add authentication. So you can't really test that locally. Um, 
But what you can do is that you can set up a Facebook application. You can say, hey, people need to be able to authenticate with my Facebook app. And then you can let people log into your app with Facebook. And then when you're on the back end, you can say, only people that have authenticated with either of these things here can submit new entries or read new entries. Yes? I can't um, can you use regular username and password authentication? Um, that's a good question. Um, I don't think you do that with Azure Mobile Service, but you could build that outside of it, I'd say. Uh, so it's not built into the Azure Mobile Service. Uh, so their authentication model depends on OAuth. So if there's an OAuth provider, or an OAuth server provider, you can use them. And you can set these permissions for all the CRUD operations. So you have, either you can say everyone can do this, that means that anyone not even with the application key can read everything in your data or add everything. Or you can say that only people that are authenticated using the application key, that means the people that have my application. Or only authenticated users, those that are logged in with either Twitter, Facebook, Azure AD, Google, or Microsoft account. And you can say also only scripts or admins. So the OAuth workflow is a bit interesting if you haven't been exposed to that before. Basically, it works like this. You're saying that I want to log in to your service. The mobile service returns me a URL with the correct authentication provider information. So I'm saying I want to log in with Facebook. Then it returns me the Facebook login URL. And then it shoves me off to facebook.com or facebookauth.com or whatever the URL is. And then when I've proceeded from that and logged in, it returns back to my device. And then my device talks back to mobile service. And the mobile service says, all right, you're logged in. Thank you very much. So it's a bit more steps to this than a normal login where you just send user password OK. So there's a bit more calls going on here, but it's really nice to not having to handle the login yourself. And if you're doing Azure, Azure AD, imagine that you're working with a large corporation that has their own AD. You can set that up to, to be a, a mirror in Azure AD. So you can bring over the users and the groups for the, Azure, for the AD people into Azure AD and say that these groups have access to my application. So you don't have to have redundant data or redundant control of the data. One of the biggest reasons that you want to do this with Azure Mobile Service is what happens if when you wake up tomorrow, you have one million users wanting to add your, use your application. If you have a paid app, you'll probably be a millionaire and you don't want to care about this anymore. But if you have a free application, you probably want to do some scaling. So the free level allows us to 500,000 API calls per subscription per month. That's, that's pretty, pretty good. So the standard level, I don't have any costs in here, but the standard level is about 1.5 million API calls per unit per month. And the premium one is 15 million API calls per month per unit. So if you have that many, that many interactions, congratulations. <laughs> Why are you here? <laughs> But yeah, that's awesome. So there's a lot of scaling options going on behind the scenes here that we can, can conform to. So I have created an application that uses Azure Mobile Services. So I'm in the Azure portal here. How many of you have seen the Azure portal before? Oh, most of you. Have you seen the new one? Not this one, the newer one? There's like five different versions <laughs> of all the portals. The Silverlight one, there's this one, and there's a bunch of different ones. Anyways, so this is the one that I like to use because it's still uh, easy and nice to use. I've gone ahead and created a new mobile service by going down to new mobile service, create that. I've set up a new uh, name for this. And then I've said that I want to create a new database. I want to have that in East Asia, for instance. I want the back end to be powered by either JavaScript or .NET. I selected JavaScript because I think that's the best thing to do. Uh, otherwise, you'll get a lot of web API stuff that you need to, to worry about. So I've already set this up because it takes some time to provision that. I have my Azure Mobile Service running in, in West US. It's ready to, be, um, ready to be used. So the first thing that we see here when we get into this, this platform is that we get a lot of cool things that we can do here. We have a, this dashboard that, that sa says, choose a platform that you want to work with. So all right, I'll choose Xamarin. Create a new Xamarin application. So it gives me a step-by-step -step thing that I need to do here. So first, I need to install Xamarin for Windows or OS X. I've done that. I've clicked this, create the table. So this creates a new to-do table that just a demo application. And then I said, 
all right, I'll, I'll download this application for iOS. I click download, and I got this thing here. So it gave me a complete application that interacts with this Azure mobile service. Before I show you the code for that, I just want to show you there's so many platforms up here. You can use Windows Store. You can even ask, how do I connect to an existing store? Here's the code to do that. Here's the, the API key to, to ruin my, my, my wallet. And then you can do Windows Phone, you can do iOS, Android. These are native iOS and native Android. So if we take a look at connect to an existing app, it's a step-by-step -step on how you do that. However, we're doing Xamarin, so I selected that. I downloaded the application. And as you might imagine, if I want to do this in a, an existing application, it's just as easy as just bringing this mobile client in here. So we have this mobile service client in Azure Mobile Service that we can use to connect to this service. And one more thing before we take a look at the code. So the data here is dynamic, or the schema for the data is dynamic. So I have a to-do item, but let's say that I want to add something to that to-do item. I have, right now, I, I think I just have like, what do I need to do and when did I do it? But let's say that I want to add who asked for this. I have an authentication, someone is logged in, I need to keep track of that person. I can add that as well and the schema just updates. However, when it comes to, um, to live databases, we probably want to turn off the dynamic schema. We don't th want things to change. So you can go into the configuration and say, hey, I don't want to update my, my table here. Leave that alone. All right, so over to the code. So I'll start this off here in my iPhone Ready Notch 3.5 simulator. Hopefully I still have network connection. We'll see in a second. So this is the application that I got downloaded. It's really nice, it's written in, in um, using that storyboarding approach. So I'll show you the editing for that. But now I got a list of things that I have already added here. I can pull this down to get it to refresh. That's all, all built in and nicely done. So I can say that, all right, so this one here is done. Uh, sometimes the, there we go. I can click that, complete it. And that fires off a call to Azure Mobile Service and says, hey, I'm done with this task, all good. And I can create new things. and add that, and that's just now added into the Azure mobile service. So to prove that, I can go over to this portal again and have a look at the data that is inserted into my to-do item table. So I can browse all the data I have here. We see that I just added this Xamarin hack day here. I have a lot of other entries that I've added, and some of them are marked as completed because I, I pulled it in from the side, clicked completed, and that's all good. Now, I mentioned that I want to be able to handle what happens on the back end when someone inserts something. So I have something called scripts here. So that's scripts for this table. So I can handle what happens when I insert something. Let's just wait for this to load. What happens when someone inserts something? I'm just saying that this is, this is done, this is, this is fine. I can do update and see what happens when I update some data. And there's really not too much code in here, right? But imagine that I could add a lot of awesome things in here. So I have the user here, for instance. I think I can and check if like user, see if there's IntelliSense. I can do, um, come on. There's supposed to be like uh, IntelliSense here, but it's gone. So you can do like user is authenticated and you can check if the user is authenticated, do that. If the username is this, if the username is the admin, send an email to someone or something like that. So you have full control of the backend here and you can say when someone is reading the data also send off a call to this thing here, ping this service to, to notify me about that, I guess. And you can set up the permissions for this, as I mentioned. So the only people that can use my application right now is the people that have my application key. So that's when I have the application key inside my app. I don't know if you, you guys saw that the, uh, the new mobile app Yo, Yo, Yo has been hacked, probably because they, they released their application keys with their app and they don't have any uh, user level permissions for all the data. Uh, I'm not too sure about that, but I read some, some stories about that and it doesn't really surprise me that if you set this up like that, so anyone with my application key can do whatever they want, then it's all good, right? So you probably want to make sure that either people are logged in for, for inserting, for updating, people need to be authenticated for delete, that's, that's something only admins can do, and so forth. All right, so let's have a look at what this Yep. <laughs> so when it comes to authorization, you 
have to do it yourself. So for example, this user can only access their own orders and the other users only yep. different orders. Okay. Uh, correct. Uh, what we did to solve that in a project that I worked on is that we're interacting with Azure AD. So we have the groups from Azure AD so we know which groups can do what. But if it comes down to uh, much fine grain than that, you probably have to, to roll your own, build something around that. Um, all right. So this project contains a lot of different things. I'm not going to go too much into details on what all of them are. But we have two different cool things here. So we have the, the storyboard for the iPad and the iPhone. So I can open this up in the iOS designer. And if this works now, I'm going to be really glad. So this worked. <laughs> Yay. So I can say that, all right, this is the layout for iOS 6. And this is the layout for iOS 7. So I get a nice view of all the SDKs that I've installed. I can ask it to render what that's going to look like. You probably noticed that the gradient changed a little bit, but it still sort of looks the same. And I can change orientation and see what happens when I tilt my phone. And I can add more views here to see what happens. And of course, we have the code to interact with the, with the mobile service in this here as well. Cool. Um, one thing to mention about the storyboarding, you can do storyboarding inside Visual Studio as well. The only problem with that is you still need to have the connection to the Mac. So you can't even do the UI storyboarding because what happens is that it renders everything on the Mac and publishes back a picture. <laughs> it's not really a picture, but it's, it renders on the Mac and then gives you something back. So Azure mobile services are really awesome when you want to work with data, and it's really easy to interact with the Xamarin applications. When I tried to do this for a shared portable class library, it wasn't really possible because there's different implementations for all the different platforms. So there's no common interface that you can use in your portable class libraries. So that's when you probably want to set up injecting actions and functions instead. All right. So a quick summary here. Uh, Xamarin makes it much easier to do cross-platform development. It's really, really makes my life easier when I do apps. I just remember doing apps five years ago, having to do iOS or, or Java for Android, and it just wasn't as much fun as doing this in C Sharp and with Xamarin. It's really nice to be able to just have one language, one team, and reach all these platforms. It makes the end users happy that the application is reached to those platforms. And someone said to me that Windows, for, Windows Phone users tend to give higher ratings than iOS users. And if you look at the comments, it's like, thank you for making this app for Windows Phone. <laughs> they don't care about the quality, right? So, so that's good. And it's really easy to share the business logic in the portable class libraries. So don't be um, um, afraid that I just had like a couple of lines of code in my portable class library you'll be able to have a lot more. So there's case studies out there showing that you can share about 90% of all your, your portable, uh, your, all your code inside your portable class library. And now with Xamarin Forms, it makes UI much, much easier. So I don't have to care about how a list view needs to look on the iOS device. I don't ha I have to care about how to interact with a web view. I don't have to care about all that stuff. Someone is taking care of the UI and it looks beautiful. Any questions? We'll do a Q&A for a couple of minutes, I guess. One thing I might um, call out then is, um, so for anyone who's not aware, so um, he showed Azure mobile services for a few moments. Yep. Um, now, Xamarin is good for doing the client side stuff on the actual device, but if you still want to do things like push notifications, you need to push notifications for each of the devices. Um, and so Windows, um, Windows Phone, Android and iOS each have different ways of doing push notifications. Um, if you want to do that, if you use um, Windows Azure mobile services, um, they have one interface, you just send a push notification and they automatically convert it and make it work correctly on each of the platforms. So if you do want to do, use push notifications, look at that. Yeah, Azure mobile services. Yeah, that's one of the reasons that I didn't want to demo the uh, <laughs> that, that push notifications. It gets pretty hard. And for Windows uh, specifically, you need to have a, a, a registered for, I'm going to upload this sometime. So it, there's a couple of more steps to do that. As David said. Thanks. Down here. <laughs> If I'm running uh, bootcamp, um, can I still, uh, uh, how do I use the iOS uh, simulator? 
Uh, you you need to run Parallels, or you need okay. to have another Mac. Cool. Um, yeah, you need to also. You don't only need to have the Mac. You need to have uh, OS X running. Another question: uh, What's uh, Xamarin's strategy around uh, Swift? Around Swift. Um, look. Uh, it doesn't really impact what happens now because you're still doing everything in C sharp and you have these shared Xamarin forms controls and all that. And Swift makes it easier for people to make applications directly for iOS, but it doesn't really affect how you would create applications for from Xamarin's perspective, I'd say. I got another question. Yep. <laughs> so we, we just uh, started a project with uh, uh, Objective C actually. Um, so if we are writing code in Objective-C, uh, is there any way to uh, reverse engineer that into Xamarin as uh, C-sharp and then uh, produce the Android app from that? Uh, simple answer is no. Okay. But if you have everything in storyboarding or if you've done, if you have the UI and nib files and all that and there's not too much app logic, you can probably get away quite easily porting that to Xamarin. Depends. Uh, what would your response to a client that says uh, a lot of the pain of Objective-C is gone now with Swift? Um, have they considered Android and Windows Phone? Right. So would you say from a developer's point of view, they would probably lean towards Swift, but a manager who wants to attack all the platforms mm. will choose Xamarin? Yeah. So if you only want to target iOS and you only have iOS developers, then of course the answer would be go with that. If you only target iOS people, use your iOS developers because they, it's going to be that platform, right? But if you have any consideration of releasing an Android app ever, or even Windows Phone, you probably want to consider another alternative than Swift or Objective-C. And what do you say to a client who's saying, what should I choose for the long-term um, strategy for our company, Cordova or Xamarin? Xamarin. <laughs> well, look, there's so much development going on with Xamarin, and I haven't used Cordova too much, so I don't know too much about that. But it's, it's reliant on JavaScript and, and like that, right? But yes. it still produces the native application. Mm. So no. you're stuck with the co lowest common denominator in that approach. You probably want to do uh, Xamarin because it makes it easier for you to interact with the native, ap like the native things that you might have from third parties. Or if you have libraries that you already have in Objective-C, it's easier from Simon's perspective, from what I've seen, to interact with that. And you get the native performance and the native user interface. Yeah. No um, problems. But uh, the, the price tag for Xamarin mm. and the fact it's not in the box is potentially going to make that um, the competition mm. or the percentage of market share that the two get um, a decent factor because the average corporate developer won't go and buy a third-party app and then when they need to get approval, I know it's only a grand, but a grand for a number of developers, yep. uh, or I use what's in the box is going to make that uh, whichever gets more market share closer. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know what about the pricing for Cordova, if it's free or... Well, it's in the box and I believe it's free, isn't it, Dave? Yeah. Hmm. So it's going to make it harder. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. yeah the, the price tag is probably a, uh, one of the more difficult parts of Xamarin. But, I mean, you, you don't have any, you're not really going back on anything. You have the full potential of the platforms. Going Cordova, I don't know if you have any, like, limitations to how much you can share among the different devices, what kind of, if you have three different projects with three different platforms. Mm. If you have the same thing in Cordova, I say, oh, that sounds really good but you have the power of the .NET framework, you have three different projects, you can really specify the, the UI for each platform if you want to do that. And if it's as easy in Cordova, that sounds good. Well, I don't think it's going to be as easy, but um, I think the problem is a lot of developers won't do the calculations as to what their hourly rate is and mm. how quickly they recoup that grant and you know, the great community they get, but I think it's going to be interesting. If they know C-sharp um, and have a background with that, it's really beneficial going with the Xamarin route. Otherwise, you have to end up learning a new API. You have to learn new, uh, new infrastructure and new tooling, right? 
Um, has Xamarin always been pay up front to develop with Visual Studio, or did you used to be able to develop the app and then pay to publish sort of thing, or pay to compile? I don't know. I can't answer that. Okay, no problem. Um, just going back to the um, Xamarin versus um, phone gap, what I find is there's a, a few lot of companies out there that have actually gone the, the phone gap down that track and they've got an app that it sort of works but it's not good enough and they've gone to Xamarin. So it's mm. people will go down that track because they like it, it sounds good, but they get there and it doesn't do what they need. Maybe five years, ten years. Yeah, uh, based on what I've seen the last couple of years, like two, if you go back two, three years, and look at what decisions were made when you wanted to do mobile apps then, I lean towards doing phone gap applications because the only things that I compared to was, I have Xamarin that is quite magical and I'm not really sure where that is going. And we had phone gap and either going native applications. So deciding to go phone gap and then the clients say, hey, this isn't really feeling like the native application. So I can see why people are updating to, to Xamarin now because it's a much more, um, uh, mature platform. Uh, with uh, regards to Xamarin Forms, where do, where do you see the limitation of how far Forms can take you and, and then now you have to go over to the native U UIs? Um, there's a, a challenge going on from Xamarin's perspective where they challenge people to make apps using Xamarin Forms. And I've seen some screenshots and you can do custom renderers for a lot of things. I saw some really crazy cool things people have made the, the last couple of days. So I haven't seen any limitations as of yet. It's probably, I mean, if you, if you do gaming, that's another discussion. But for all the data-driven applications and all the applications that I expect you guys do, you probably don't have too many limitations, if any. Only, about the only limitation might be with charts and graphs and things like that. So if you want that, yeah, you probably have to jump down to a, just um, that single view being a native implementation and then use controls from Telerik or Infragistics and chuck on charts and graphs. That's probably where you hit the limitations. Um, business visualization. Just a follow up to that question. So, so let's say if you are um, into graph, graphs, um, so do you, are you creating a new um, uh, project for that? Or you can use, you know, you can mix and match, let's say you have your main application is in um, summer in forms and then you can just show uh, the native um, controls. Um, hmm. That's a tough one. I mean, if you already have invested time in the uh, native UI, that's, that's really good. But if you're doing something completely new today and you want to be able to do um, interactions with other things that are natively, you can still do that. So new stuff, I'd say Xamarin Forms because it's giving you the native UI. But if you have Xamarin since before and you have these, let's say for iOS, you have some, some view controller for something, then you can still navigate to that. You can still use all that code. Because what happens when you compile this, right, it brings that into your application. So you can still do custom navigations, you can do custom interactions with the UI that you've created previously. And you can still do the, the bindings towards Objective-C code if you want to do that. Did that answer the question? Yep. Um, Michael, are you going to be touching on anything yeah, like that? OK, so in Michael's session, we'll talk a bit more. So, so just to follow up on, on that point you made, so if you've built it with uh, the old method and using a lot of native U UI, if now you can retro you can bring in Xamarin Forms if you're making enhancements to these applications mm -hmm. without any issues now? Yeah, I'd say you can do that. It, there's probably going to be like a, a little step you have to take to get that to work, but once you get that to work, it's, it's going to be seamless and work nicely. Uh, one of the issues they say in Xamarin that the apps. Oh. One of the issues they say in uh, Xamarin that the app size gets bigger than yeah. normal. Uh, what do you say about this? Um, so I built a pretty large business application, and and the uh, executable is like 40 megs or something like that. So what happens is that they compile down the parts of the .NET framework that you use and port that natively, because you can't run the .NET framework on the device, and they just uh, cherry pick what what they what you're using, right? So I haven't seen the application growing too large. I mean, 40 megs is, is pretty good. Uh, sure, if you have to download that on Australia on 3G, that's probably going to take forever. But it's not another issue. 
But I haven't seen any problem with that yet. Any other questions? Look, this is just an overview of all the things you can do in Xamarin, and I'm really expecting you to do some cool things today, and I know that the others are going to go into more detail into both uh, Xamarin forums and to Azure mobile services. <laughs>